Hi, my name is Andre McKenzie, and I'm a historian of uh, crime, culture, and conspiratorial politics in early modern England, uh, with a focus on the 17th century, uh, the 1600s. My talk today uh, is about a London magistrate whose uh, mysterious disappearance and death in the autumn of 1678 become, became one of the most famous unsolved mysteries in British history. But this is, it was more than just uh, a murder mystery. Uh, it, this is also a story of how rumors and speculations about the death of one man sparked a major moral panic and a serious political crisis. The man was Sir Edmund Barry Godfrey. He was a Westminster Justice of the Peace, and a Justice of the Peace in this period is simply an unpaid official tasked to keep the peace and to receive criminal complaints. He left his home near Charing Cross on the morning of Saturday, the 12th of October, 1678, and he never came home. His body was found five days later, in the early evening of Thursday, the 17th of October, in Primrose Hill, now a very fashionable suburb of Greater London. The body itself was found near the present-day site of the Lamonia, a, a very popular Greek restaurant in, in London. And this was about five kilometers away from his home, uh, about three miles. The body was discovered face down. His gloves and his hat and scabbard were found nearby. And he was face down in a ditch, impaled on his own sword. The forensic evidence seemed to rule out suicide. The fact that there was not one sword wound, but two, uh, made it highly unlikely that the wounds had been self-inflicted. The fact that there was little or no blood at the, on the clothes of the dead man or, man or at the scene also suggested that the wounds had been inflicted posthumously after death. Bruises on the body and a ligature mark around the neck seem to indicate that the magistrate had been strangled or garroted. Robbery was quickly ruled out as the considerable sum of money that, that Godfrey had been carrying on his person was still there intact in his pockets, as, as also some of his uh, fairly expensive jewelry. The fact that the dead men's clothes uh, were clean and dry and the surrounding area was muddy and it had just rained, uh, as is almost always the case in London in October then as now, uh, suggested that the murder had taken place elsewhere and the body had been uh, dumped at the scene. The tracks of a cart, a bent grate, and some sc uh, straw scattered nearby uh, seemed to corroborate that theory. So from the beginning, uh, contemporaries were convinced that, most contemporaries were convinced that this could not be a suicide, but it seemed rather to be a murder, clumsily staged as suicide. Uh, but it also opened up other conspiratorial possibilities. Was it a, a suicide staged as a murder? Or some kind of a more elaborate scenario, for instance, a murder staged as a murder staged as a suicide. So there's all kinds of possibilities from the beginning that were debated. From the moment of Godfrey's disappearance on the Saturday, speculation ran rife, as did all kinds of rumors, even from the very afternoon of his disappearance. The most prominent of all of these rumors was that Godfrey had been murdered by the papists, that is to say the pejorative term used by the English Protestant majority uh, to refer to Catholics, implying that Catholics worshipped the Pope rather than God. Within days, uh, the Privy Council had been notified uh, of Godfrey's disappearance and the wildest speculations circulated widely. The discovery of the body sparked a major moral panic over the dangers of a, a, a fictional Catholic conspiracy, uh, the so-called Popish plot. Uh, it also, Godfrey's disappearance and death also helped to detonate the, what is known as the exclusion crisis, a serious and prolonged political and constitutional challenge to the authority of the king, Charles II, and the right of his Catholic brother James, the Duke of York, to succeed him. So the obvious question is, why all this fuss over a 56-year-old bachelor? 
he was a reasonably prosperous wood and coal merchant and an active and respected but hardly top-ranking official. The reason for contemporaries, at least, uh, was obvious. Godfrey had several weeks before his death in his capacity as a magistrate taken the information, that is to say the sworn deposition, of Titus Oates. Uh, this is a man whose name now is a byword for perjury, a scurrilous rogue, uh, a disreputable and unemployed uh, former Anglican clergyman who claimed to have feigned a conversion to Catholicism in order to infiltrate Catholic uh, ranks, enlisting in uh, a Jesuit seminary supposedly to uncover a damnable plot against uh, the uh, Protestant religion, the Church of England, and uh, King Charles II. The specific charges uh, that uh, Titus Oates alleged were highly implausible. Charles II was a monarch who personally favored toleration and uh, whose sympathy for Catholics was only too well known and indeed uh, somewhat criticized. Other accusations uh, made by Titus Oates, such as the claim that all English Catholics uh, of any uh, socioeconomic standing were privy to the plot, uh, and that there was a plan to cut the throats of hundreds of thousands of English Protestants, were also patently ridiculous, at least on the face, on their face. So why was it that this, this plot uh, gained such traction? And this was for two reasons. Unfortunately, there was a very small grain of truth in Oates's informations. The Catholicism of Charles II's brother and heir, James Duke of York, was an open secret. Uh, and the king's own dodgy secret diplomacy with Louis XIV's France was also widely suspected. The Duchess of York's secretary, the zealous Catholic convert Edward Coleman, had been soliciting money and other aid from papal and foreign agents to help with his tolerationist uh, projects in England, essentially colluding with foreign governments attempting to bribe the English Parliament to change the laws uh, and also to force a dissolution of what was uh, a very intolerant cavalier uh, anti-Catholic Parliament. So Coleman, uh, working ostensibly for the Duchess of York, was really seen as working in reality for her husband, the Duke of York, the King's heir. Coleman's correspondence caused great embarrassment uh, for James, uh, uh, James the Duke of York, who would later in 1685 become king in his own right, uh, King James II. So we see here on the left, Parliament published the most incriminating parts of Coleman's uh, uh, correspondence, and here we see a later reissue of that publication after the Glorious Revolution, in which James's complicity is more or less spelled out in the title, The Intrigues of the French King and Others for Extirpating the Protestant Religion, etc., etc. But the French King and Others, the implication is other kings are being referred to. So the second proof of the plot, as it were, was the death of Godfrey himself. It was believed by many Godfrey's murder was the result of his initial investigation of the plot and an attempt on the part of Catholics to suppress that investigation and to stifle the plot and all of the evidence against the Jesuits and others. An interesting fact of this uh, very interesting case was uh, the, the fact that Godfrey uh, happened to be a friend of Edward Coleman. And this is, this is already taking us into a very convoluted story. Uh, Edward Coleman uh, had, had in fact uh, met secretly with Godfrey shortly before Godfrey's disappearance and death. Uh, and it, and uh, evidence would emerge that Godfrey had gone to warn his friend against uh, against uh, about the charges uh, that Titus Oates had brought forward and the threat that it posed to Coleman's master, the Duke of York. But for, for mo in the view of contemporaries, at least, the fact that Godfrey had met his death so soon after receiving Titus Oates's evidence was seen uh, was 
could not be seen as a coincidence. And of course, we all know today that there are no coincidences uh, in conspiracy theories, and we're soon really uh, zooming towards a, a deeply conspiratorial age. So uh, thus Godfrey's death proved the reality of the popish plot uh, with ultimately tragic consequences for the scores of English and Irish Catholics whose judicial murders uh, can be linked either directly or or indirectly to Titus Oates's false accusations. And other witnesses too would come forward, uh, as we'll see. In his sermon at Godfrey's funeral on the 31st of October, 1678, the Anglican clergyman, William Lloyd, whipped his auditors up into a frenzy of anti-papist uh, enthusiasm and hatred by asking and answering the question of qui bono, who benefits that quintessentially conspiratorial question. According to Lloyd, the wicked men who had benefited uh, from, from Godfrey's death were clearly the Jesuits who, had, uh, who held it lawful, quote, uh, to kill men that would prejudice, prejudice them or their religion. Common sense obligations were swept away in a groundswell of emotions. Forgotten was the fact that Godfrey was known to be tolerant towards Catholics and on friendly terms with many of them, including Coleman. Uh, no one seemed to notice the fact, too, uh, that Oates, uh, who had brought forward the uh, evidence in the first place, was still living. How could you suppress the, the plot and not dispose of the principal witness? Uh, and this later satirical print uh, from 1682 draws attention to that with uh, the killers strangling Godfrey and then running away as we can see them in the background saying, next, Oates. So why the Catholics? And, and uh, for most 17th century people, that wasn't much of, uh, of an intellectual leap. It was an obvious assumption. When it came to treason, gunpowder, and arson and assassination plots, uh, the usual suspects, to quote the old film Casablanca, were members of the small but highly stigmatized uh, English Catholic community. A stridently anti-Catholic identity had coalesced in the second half of the, the 16th century, the 1500s, during the long reign of Elizabeth I. This identity owed almost nothing to theology and, and essentially everything to fears of both internal and external enemies. Uh, really, almost all of them Catholic threats in one form or another. The Pope, who had excommunicated Elizabeth in, in 1570 uh, with his papal bull, Regnans and Excelsis, essentially telling all English Catholics that they owed no loyalty to the Queen and that they were, uh, in fact, not only uh, allowed to rise up against her, but that that might even be a good idea. Uh, this, of course, would have tragic consequences for the uh, mostly loyal and law-abiding English Catholic community for centuries. There were also very, very vivid memories of uh, threats by uh, the, the King of Spain, Philip II, who had sent the notorious Spanish Armada to invade England, memories of bloody Mary Tudor, who had burned roughly 300 English Protestants at the stake during her short reign, um, as well as anxieties over other uh, foreign Catholic threats. Uh, so we also have in the 17th century more narratives that add to this conviction, more, more allegations against Catholics that seem to confirm this conspiratorial anti-Catholic narrative. Uh, the, the real, the actual 1605 gunpowder plot involving a small group of disgruntled Catholics, an attempt to blow up both houses of parliament, Syria, uh, which would have been the greatest terrorist uh, event, I think, in history and would have effectively wiped out the whole ruling class or very nearly of England if it had been successful and not as it was uh, uh, thwarted at, at what was essentially the last moment. Uh, Catholics were also blamed as either conspirators or provo provocateurs uh, for the uh, 1641 Irish Rebellion, uh, even for starting the English or British Civil Wars that followed on the heels of the, uh, the Irish Rebellion, and also 
even the Great Fire of London, which was believed to have been started by Jesuits masquerading as Protestant sectarians in a, in a false flag uh, operation. So we see many elements of conspiracy thinking that are familiar to us today uh, apparent in the 17th century as well. So England in the, in the 1670s was ripe for a conspiratorial crisis. The, uh, Charles II, the king, had, had uh, really outlived his honeymoon period. He had accumulated military defeats, sex scandals, and natural disasters, such as the Great Fire of London. Um, and, and there were, there were in, increasing anxieties about the threat of uh, Louis XIV of France, uh, who was uh, threatening uh, his, the borders of, of many uh, continental uh, Protestant uh, nations, including, of course, the Protestant Netherlands. Um, not least, uh, simmering uncertainty about the succession boiled over into a crisis in this period. In 1673, the Test Act essentially outed the king's brother and heir, James, a Duke of York, as a Catholic when he stepped down from his office rather than take an oath that involved denouncing the Pope and the Catholic tenet of transubstantiation. So uh, while the philandering Charles II had uh, acknowledged over a dozen children uh, with various mistresses, his, uh, his wife, the Portuguese princess, who was of course a Catholic, uh, Catherine of Berganza, uh, appeared to be the only woman in the kingdom whom he could not impregnate. So that was a real problem. Um, and this perfect conspiratorial storm is really exacerbated by fears of Louis XIV on the continent, as I mentioned. He's seen as encroaching uh, on his neighbors, uh, and, and many English Protestants see it as a, their patriotic duty to support their uh, co-religionists on the continent. Uh, and also this anti-Catholicism is really linked to uh, a sense that Catholicism was a fit with arbitrary and absolutist rule, uh, that it was uh, a, a threat, an existential threat to English liberties, the rule of law, and institutions like Parliament. Conspiracy theories about Catholics had long been weaponized uh, by moral and religious reformers and, and constitutional critics of the monarchy. So Puritans, uh, parliamentarians during the Civil War, and members of the political opposition who would, after 1680, be termed Whigs. In a characteristically Puritan conflation of the political with the personal, uh, anti-popery drew on images of, uh, of, of moral, social, and physical disorder, decay, disease, and depravity. The late Stuart Kings were accused of secretly tending to uh, Catholicism and arbitrary government, and indeed, as I mentioned, those things were seen as, as inextricably linked. Uh, but they were also seen as being riddled with uh, vice and sexually transmitted disease. This uh, may well have been literally true, according to the French ambassador, who gleefully reported in 1674 that Charles had given his French Catholic mistress, the Duchess of Portsmouth, Louise du Queroy, uh, chaud de pisse, which means gonorrhea. Uh, it's interesting to note that after uh, this time, 1674, Charles has no more children, uh, either with, his, with uh, the Duchess of Portsmouth or with any other of his mistresses, which may well uh, be uh, evidence of the truth of that particular report. One particularly misogynistic conspiracy theory current in the 1670s was that Charles II's queen, Catherine of Braganza, had been deliberately chosen as a bribe for him because it had been known in advance by uh, the then uh, Lord Chancellor, the Earl of Clarendon, that she was infertile. Uh, so that to increase the chances of his own uh, grandchildren uh, who, were, uh, who were descended from his uh, the, the daughter of the, uh, of the Earl of Clarendon's uh, was married to, uh, to the Duke of York. So the story was is that Catherine of Braganza was 
uh, plagued by a, uh, a continual flux of blood in her secret parts. And that, of course, is a quote. So we see that anti-popery was more than just the pornography of the Puritans, as Richard Hofstetter famously described it in his essay on the paranoid style in, uh, in American politics. It was also a powerful agent of desacralization, corrosive of monarchical authority. It was a way to undermine the sacredness, the sanctity of uh, the crown. Godfrey's death pr proved a boon to the political opposition. Uh, the last confirmed sighting of Godfrey on the Saturday he disappeared was about 1 p.m. on the Strand. That is to say, near, uh, near St. Clement's Church, only steps away from Somerset House, the uh, residence of Queen Catherine of Braganza. Today, uh, as you see on the bottom right, uh, you can rent, uh, you can rent um, the premises for events, including weddings, uh, but in 1678, the palace had more sinister associations. It was believed that Godfrey had been lured inside of Somerset House and there dispatched. The offer of a large uh, 500 pound, and that, that was a very large amount of sum, uh, sum of money in this period, the offer of a large reward uh, soon flushed out a venal witness whose testimony uh, was corrobor corroborated by a second man. So this first witness claimed that Godfrey had been murdered by several Jesuits and uh, who had since made their escape and three servants of the queen. Uh, so the second witness comes up with a story that roughly corroborates this, although there are significant dif differences, and also the fact that he clearly gave this, uh, this confession under duress and later uh, retracted it uh, several times, finally retracting it definitively in 1686 and being charged with, with perjury. But none of this uh, would save the three hapless men uh, the innocent men who uh, were ec ultimately executed for Godfrey's murder, Robert Green, Lawrence Hill, and Henry Barry in 1679. Just as in modern times, the theory of a lone, lone shooter, uh, for instance, uh, in the person of the obscure misfit uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, seems woefully incommensurate with the scale of the emotion unleashed by JFK's assassination in 1963, uh, so too the execution of three completely ordinary working men uh, seemed to, uh, to contemporaries anticlimactic and deeply unsatisfying. It didn't fit the uh, degree of emotion that was appropriate to uh, Godfrey's disappearance and death. So in both cases, in the case of Kennedy, as Kennedy's assassination and Godfrey's uh, murder, conspiracy theories of appropriate grandiosity soon filled the void. The fact that, uh, that the three men, uh, Green, Barry, and Hill, had uh, resolutely maintained their innocence fed not suspicions uh, fed not so much suspicions that they'd been wrongly executed as a conviction that the true uh, masterminds of the crime remained at large, still pulling the strings in the background. Who were they? So the conspiracy had been only partially unmasked. It went deeper. How do you get to those people? In the political crisis that unfolded, rumors and fake news abounded, shaping not only public opinion, but even directing the uh, parliamentary investigation into Godfrey's uh, death. The committee investigating uh, Godfrey's death followed wild second and third hand stories, such as rumors that the queen and her ladies in waiting had stored the, um, the, the corpse in the palace of Somerset House and danced around it as it lay there. The fact that white wax droplets had been found on the dead man's clothes had, was seen as additional proof. Only uh, priests or servants of high-ranking aristocrats used expensive white beeswax candles rather than the more affordable tallow or animal fat candles. 
that were more common uh, to other households. The Popish plot, and here we see uh, the death of Godfrey was long designed before it was done. This is a manuscript thrown. Uh, these were, were seditious manuscripts often thrown in public places uh, and passed around surreptitiously attacking the queen and others um, uh, about Godfrey's death. Uh, so we see here uh, an illustration of the ladies-in-waiting dancing around the corpse. So the, the Popish plot created a climate in which things that had only been speculated before, behind closed doors and in the dark smoky rooms of taverns and coffee houses, were now dragged out into the light. Uh, the heir to the throne, the king's brother, James Duke of York, was attacked in Parliament not only for supposedly uh, attempting to thwart the investigation of the plot, but also for having started the Great Fire of London, for being an arsonist. And this wasn't even a new accusation. A parliamentary committee uh, that had been struck right after the disaster in 1666 had hinted more or less at the same conclusion. This, of course, was false. This was pure calumny. Uh, but other elements of Titus Oates's accusations touched on uncomfortable and inconvenient truths. For instance, James was not only a Catholic, but a fact that Oates himself did not know, uh, but was something that was indeed a very compromising secret, he had hosted a, a consult of Jesuits, that is to say a Jesuit meeting in his own palace of St. James uh, the previous spring. April 1678. He, of course, was privy to secret negotiations with France and other secret agents. During the political crisis that follows Godfrey's death, James is uh, exiled and very nearly excluded from the succession. So the, 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 um, the, the direct line of the, the, the hereditary succession is very nearly uh, uh, bypassed. Um, and this is in some ways a, a dress rehearsal for the Glorious Revolution, which expressly forbids the, uh, any, any Catholic from, from uh, inheriting the throne after 1689. So in this period, it really did seem in the, in the exclusion crisis as though England teetered on the brink of another civil war. In an age in which uh, the king could not be attacked directly without incurring charges of sedition, a 1661 uh, act had made it illegal, uh, a criminal offense, even to accuse the king uh, in print or in speech of being a Catholic. Nonetheless, uh, Godfrey, speculations about Godfrey's murder uh, and the investigation into it allowed people to uh, launch indirect uh, criticisms of the king. Although such criticisms focused in traditional style and time-honored tradition on corrupt advisors and ministers and mistresses and so on, uh, ostensibly uh, leaving the, uh, the underlying monarchical principles unchallenged, speculation, the speculation nonetheless opened a door that could not easily be shut. If the Catholicism of the heir to the throne was an open secret, so too was Charles II's secret diplomacy with Louis XIV, of King of France. Many knew or suspected the truth about the king's secret 1670 Treaty of Dover uh, with Louis XIV, seen here on the right, in which Charles promised to support a French foreign policy and convert to Catholicism in exchange for secret subsidies uh, that would obviate the need for him to call Parliament uh, to, grant him, uh, to grant him money. However, because uh, conspiracy thinking is inherently partisan, as we know all too well today, even accusations that were based in fact could be refuted as politically motivated uh, and dismissed by uh, people on the other partisan, across the partisan divide. At the same time, even wild and false accusations tended to be countered not by logic or skepticism, but by other opposing conspiracy theories. One conspiratorial nail drove out another. As the crisis deepened, loyalists, or Tories as they came to be known, uh, posited counter theories, fanning suspicions that Godfrey's murder was in fact an elaborate frame-up uh, mounted by the opponents of the king. 
The royalist propagandist Roger Lestrange uh, published a book during the reign of Charles's Catholic brother James, uh, claiming that Godfrey had, in fact, committed suicide, that he had fell on his own sword on Primrose Hill, and that his body had been afterwards staged so that it looked like a murder. Uh, so this was a big, this involved a cover-up both on the part of Godfrey's household, his brothers, and the political opposition. Another uh, contemporary, the lawyer, the Tory lawyer, uh, Roger North, believed that Godfrey had indeed been murdered, but he'd been murdered by the king's enemies, by uh, leading members of the political opposition as part of a Republican plot to frame the Duke of York for Godfrey's death, uh, as well as the king, and to bring down the monarchy. In his unpublished manuscript notes, uh, Roger North hinted at a, an even deep, deeper and darker conspiracy. In a dark business as this is, he writes, there must be a consideration of what goes before and what followed after, what disturbed our peace, and when moved and settled in the room, and then the qui bono, etc., will answer the question. In other words, who benefited from the... Uh, from an attack on the future James II, but the man who would depose him uh, and become his successor, uh, William of Orange, who would become William III in, after 1688. So ironically, while people may latch on to conspiracy theories because they're looking for simple and emotionally satisfying explanations, Conspiracy theories have a tendency to snowball and become ever more complex and improbable as they try to incorporate everything into the, their conspiratorial paradigm. The long series of accusations, fake news, and sham plots uh, and counterplots of the 1670s and 80s uh, in which we not only get a conspiratorial narrative, but we get counter-narratives. Uh, we get all sorts of competing explanations most of them relying on conspiratorial notions, eventually uh, had the effect of undermining the credibility of both politicians and the press, bringing people to a saturation uh, point, and eventually creating what I would call a kind of plot fatigue, in which passion and conviction were replaced by cynicism, moral relativism, and indifference. As time passed, uh, conspiracy theories about Godfrey became less urgent and, and, and current as the hatreds and suspicions became less personal and hence less compelling. Late, a later 19th and 20th century commentators and scholars also became increasingly squeamish about the prejudices and the credulity of their ancestors. So educated people in the 19th century were no longer comfortable with the overt anti-Catholicism of their ancestors. Older traditional Whig accounts separated the, the messy and embarrassing excesses of the Popish plot from a, a, a more self-congratulatory narrative of progress that could be superimposed on the exclusion crisis. So in this, in this scenario, Whigs were not conspiracy theorists. They were uh, liberty-loving pioneers of parliamentary democracy battling the tyrannical late Stuart monarchs. In contrast, both older and newer, including one very recent work on the topic, uh, Tory narratives see the plot as a hoax concocted by the political opposition, some, a political fiction manipulated by them, especially the Earl of Shaftesbury, a kind of puppet master of the plot. Still probably the, the standard narrative by John Kenyon in the 1970s uh, really sees the Popish plot as a product of mass hysteria and prejudice. When it comes to explaining the death uh, of Sir Edmund Burry Godfrey, most modern, uh, most modern writers have chosen, have preferred to focus on suicide or on plausible Protestant psychopaths uh, as though uh, in, in an attempt to renounce uh, the conspiratorial explanations uh, that, and, and that led to the miscarriages of justice and the, the judicial murders of the Popish plot. And I understand that, that, that these are emotionally compelling reasons to favor those explanations, but as my book demonstrates, uh, the, not just the documentary evidence, but the forensic evidence does not line up with suicide. Uh, to uh, 
to find out who murdered uh, Godfrey, and I do in fact identify his murderer, a man, a very prominent figure who had both motive, opportunity, and indeed the profile of a killer. Uh, you will need to, to, to uh, read the book, uh, which came out late in uh, 2022. But even more importantly uh, than unraveling this mystery, uh, this book is about demonstrating how and why it was that contemporaries genuinely believed that Godfrey was murdered. Uh, and in fact, had good reasons to be suspicious of, uh, of standard narratives uh, and even of the government. So as scholars in the last few years have increasingly appreciated, we no longer have the luxury to consign uh, conspiracy theories in, and the persecutions to which they gave rise into, uh, it, it, into a safely bygone age, uh, more irrational, uh, more barbaric, uh, more emotional than our own. We know that this can happen in any time or place. Uh, certainly, conspiracy theories in the 1670s and 80s in England were not consigned to the lunatic fringe. They were at the very center of mainstream politics. Not only that, but the suspicions and distrust they engendered uh, served as self-fulfilling prophecies. In other words, conspiracy theories begat real conspir conspiracies. If you believe that invisible or, or partly invisible enemies conspiring against you would stop at nothing to destroy you, that inhibit, that erodes your own inhib inhibitions towards uh, law-breaking and even violence in turn. So it's an erosion of civility uh, and an, an erosion of inhibitions against taking drastic and illegal and often violent uh, action. In my recent book, I, I've uncovered evidence that suggests that many close to Godfrey knew more about the case than they were willing or able to say. Uh, many of them were afraid of speaking out openly about their suspicions. Many, uh, some of these uh, su suspicions were voiced in taverns, some in manuscript, uh, manuscript documents and newsletters, uh, some I've managed to put together both from print uh, and manuscript sources meant never to be shared, including some things that were effectively in cipher or in shorthand. Uh, so many credible witnesses re reported that Godfrey had confided, confided to them that he was master of a dangerous secret that would prove fatal to him, and that he, that he feared that he would become the first martyr of the plot. He told several close friends that he had been warned that he'd be knocked in the head. Uh, that he'd been upbraided and threatened by two great men. Uh, it was widely believed that one of those men was the Duke of York and that the other was the King's uh, principal minister, the Earl of Danby. And indeed, several reputable witnesses claimed that they'd seen Godfrey uh, that last Saturday morning and afternoon at the cockpit, the uh, residence of the Lord Treasurer, uh, who was effectively the Prime Minister, the Earl of Danby. The two supposedly exchanged heated words, and while Godfrey had been seen entering Danby's house, nobody saw him leave. So William Lloyd, uh, who was, the, was at the time of this correspondence, the Bishop of Bangor and later became Bishop of Worcester, was approached by uh, the, the Tory propagandist Roger Lestrange uh, in 1686. This is during the reign of the Catholic James II, and James had given Roger Lestrange carte blanche. He had, he had uh, encouraged him to open a new investigation into Godfrey's death. Got, uh, so Lestrange contacted Lloyd because Lloyd was known to have been not just the curate of Godfrey's parish, and you may recall he had delivered the funeral sermon, sermon for Godfrey as well, but he uh, was a personal friend of the dead man and who he had also interviewed many people suspected of being involved in Godfrey's death during the investigation, uh, and also had been in contact with Godfrey's household, his servants and his brothers. Roger Lestrange uh, later writes up uh, some of this correspondence in his book on uh, Godfrey's death, uh, but in fact, uh, I've managed to decipher some of uh, Lloyd's, all of Lloyd's shorthand correspondence with Lestrange, uh, which survives in the Gloucestershire Record Office, and these, uh, the uh, documents you see here are draft shorthand letters that were essentially written by Lloyd uh, partly as a, as a kind of a cipher. And those letters, although cited 
uh, liberally by a stranger often cited out of context and to, to uh, give a different meaning to the, to the, the uh, actual words that, that intended by Lloyd. So we see here um, really new insight uh, that, that the, the correspondent sheds interesting new light on what people close to Godfrey really believed about his murder. And Lloyd was remained convinced, despite all of uh, Lestrange's heavy-handed arg heavy arguments uh, and browbeating, that his friend had indeed been murdered by Papis. Uh, this is based both on what he had witnessed himself and what he had heard from Godfrey's household. Godfrey's maid reported that, the, that, her, that her master had received a mysterious letter the night before his, uh, his disappearance, uh, presumably summoning him to some sort of a meeting. His housekeeper claimed that Godfrey had spent the evening frantically burning papers. Uh, his household and friends clearly believed he had gone to a, me to a meeting with some great man, uh, either possibly the Earl of Danby, but more likely uh, a high-ranking uh, servant of the Duke of York on that fa last fatal Saturday afternoon. The fact that Godfrey's pocketbook, in which he kept notes of his examinations, that it was missing from, from his body had aroused suspicions from the first. There were even some reports that Edward Coleman, the Duke of York's uh, 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 servant, effectively, uh, had delivered a confession to Godfrey shortly before uh, Coleman had been committed to prison, and that it was an attempt to get rid of this that had been one of the motivations for Godfrey's murder. Lloyd suggests uh, that Godfrey was murdered both because of the horrible secrets uh, and we see here, here it is, uh, one of the more intel easily intelligible parts of the shorthand. Uh, Lloyd suggests Godfrey was murdered because of the horrible secrets that Coleman had con supposedly confided to his friend. Uh, and Lloyd is, is, is so worried about uh, the explosiveness of these secrets that he insists and, and he exhorts Lestrange not to further investigate the matter. Uh, not to ravel further into this matter, it will but set people's minds in a ferment, inquiring into that matter of Sir Edmund Godfrey's death, and perhaps it will occasion things to be pursued, which will not be for His Majesty's service. And His Majesty's service, His Majesty, of course, is James II. But what needs this qui bono? Uh, in other words, it's that he's implying again that Godfrey's death somehow benefited James and somehow James might have been involved. So what were these secrets? Um, they were secrets serious enough to make Lloyd afraid of, uh, of the consequences of their exposure. They made him very nervous as all this interlining and, and scribbling out and rewriting in the draft uh, indicates. We, this isn't, of course, the letter ultimately sent to Lestrange. It's a draft, but it, 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 it does, uh, I think, bear witness to Lloyd's distressed state of mind. Lloyd urges Lestrange to say nothing of his letter. I would not give you this under my hand, but in confidence of your justice and friendship, for I know an evil man might make evil use of it and an enemy would use it so that it might do me hurt, but I believe that you are neither of these. So the horrible secrets, what were they? And in my book, I talk a lot about the various kinds of rumors and secrets, and they also involve not just the Duke of York, the Earl of Danby, the Queen, the King, and so on, but they also drew in other people, uh, other prominent figures who, as it turned out, had a very compromising secrets to which Godfrey was privy, including the person I, I believe is the murderer. Many uh, contemporaries, of course, whispered all kinds of secrets about the king. I've mentioned secret Anglo-French uh, diplomacy conducted between Charles and his cousin Louis the Fourteenth of France. Um, certainly, the lack of trust in the government was not entirely irrational. There were reasons to suspect uh, suspect the crown. Uh, during the Popish plot and exclusion crisis, the king, his brother, and his mistress were suspected, and I, rightly, I, as I've said, as I've uh, explained in one article, uh, of 
of witness tampering and even attempting to fall, plant false evidence on their political enemies. When in 1683, the Earl of Essex, jailed in the Tower of London for a suspected, for suspected uh, complicity in a plot against the government, was found dead with his uh, throat, throat slit with a razor, it was whispered that the king and his brother had murdered him, that it wasn't suicide, but in fact murder. Even more damning was the, were the reports that emerged after, uh, shortly after Charles II's death in February 1685, uh, in which he had, and I think we have incontrovertible evidence from various places of this, uh, on his deathbed he had uh, belatedly honored the promise he had made to Louis XIV some 15 years before to convert to Catholicism, literally at the last moment, calling for a priest and accepting the last rites, the Catholic last rites. If the head of the Anglican Church had all along been a secret papist, had he been a secret assassin as well? Uh, so perhaps this was not even so far-fetched. As we know, uh, anti-Catholic conspiracy theories continued to flourish well into the 19th and even 20th century and arguably uh, have been revived to some degree today, um, in both Britain and, and, and America particularly. Uh, the, the awful disclosures of Moriah Monk was a runaway, semi-pornographic bestseller. It was a, su a supposed first-person expose of a former uh, nun from Montreal, so it's got a Canadian connection too, detailing the secret orgies and murders of illegitimate infants in convents uh, committed by the Catholic clergy. In his 1903 book, uh, John Pollock, a very distinguished uh, British academic, revived the theory that Godfrey had in fact been murdered by Jesuits to protect the Duke of York. Uh, and to this day there has been no openly Catholic Prime Minister of Great Britain. Uh, Tony Blair only came out as it were as a Catholic after he stepped down from public life in the early 21st century. So modern uh, sociological studies tend to pathologize the phenomenon of conspiracy uh, theories, and especially those who sub subscribe to them, as irrational, misguided, and even unhinged. As I've suggested here, this should not blind us to the fact that uh, the lack of trust in government makes anything possible or anything believable. So I also wanted to point out uh, in, in concluding that uh, not enough attention is paid to the effects of conspiracy theory. We often talk about, uh, about the causes of conspiracy thinking, but the effects are equally important. Uh, what, what can conspiracy thinking do or achieve, or, or more accurately, undermine or destroy? Today, as we know, conspiracy thinking erodes, erodes trust in authority, legal and political institutions, uh, official sources of information, science, the mainstream press, and academic publications. Uh, conspiracy thinking demonizes minority groups, anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism still thrive in modern conspiracy uh, theories overlaid with such bizarre modern additions as UFOs, pedophile pizzerias, and interdimensional reptiles. Uh, but conspiracy theories also radicalize people, leading people to believe that anything is permitted in defense of, of oneself and one's family against such ruthless and sinister enemies. Uh, in the 17th century, the Whig opposition probably found a few Catholic, Catholics to be acceptable collateral damage in their righteous struggle to expose and, and thwart the covert designs of late Stuart, uh, late Stuart monarchy. So the end justified the means, uh, and when the established orthodoxy that was under attack was the divine right of kings, I think we can get on board with that. Most of, to most of us, this is not something we hold dear. Uh, but when conspiracy theories attack our own sacred cows, science, the press, democracy, the rule of law, obviously it's a different story. As I've mentioned, I do uh, propose a solution to the murder mystery in my recent book, Conspiracy Culture in Stuart England. Uh, but ultimately, who the real murderer was is not as important as the fact that hundreds of thousands of people, most of them, many of them intelligent and well-informed, genuinely believed 
that Godfrey had been murdered as a diabolical plot against English liberty and the Protestant religion. The investigation into the causes of Godfrey's death had a permanent and deleterious effect on political culture. It activated a kind of perpetual motion machine of paranoia and distrust, uh, undermining faith in public institutions and authority long after the initial crisis had passed. Roger North's words about the investigation into Godfrey's death continue to resonate today. Conspiracy theories generate not answers, but more questions, not open discussion, uh, but lead to, uh, into a death spiral of fear and suspicion. The commonplace was that this daring fact, the murder, an odd sort of daring to kill a man in a corner and hide him three miles off in a ditch, was to hinder a farther search into the bottom of the plot. After this, every new witness that came in made us start, now we shall come to the bottom. And so it continued from one witness to another, year after year, till at last had no bottom, but in the bottomless pit. Thank you.